have a Bible, let's uh, go ahead and take our Bibles once again. This time, we're going to turn to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. We read, uh, really, the passage that I wanted to concentrate on this, this morning. I was going to have a little bottle or packet of, oh, maybe Prilosec, something like that. You ever have heartburn? <laughs> I do. <laughs> you know what? Here's here's just a, a a great tip. I found that a little bit of uh, organic apple cider vinegar with a little water will instantly neutralize heartburn acid. So if you you have that problem tonight when you lay down, try that. It really works, and it works right away. But I'm telling you. A heartburn is really unpleasant, isn't it? And sometimes it's downright painful. And uh, not sure what all triggers it. I think perhaps certain types of food may. Maybe food that's too spicy. Maybe food that is too uh, acidy. Uh, but, uh, you know, you try to avoid it, <laughs> heartburn, if it's at all possible. There are two of Jesus' followers here in Luke 24 that declared that they developed a case of not physical, but spiritual heartburn. And spiritual heartburn is not something that you want to avoid. It's something that all of us need. It's something that we should want. And I want to take just a few minutes this, this morning as we look in the scripture and show you what it is and why you need it and how you can get it. Before we do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, just thankful this day for the opportunity that we have to gather together. We're here because of Jesus. We're here because he's alive. We're here because he rose on the third day, just as he predicted that he would. Lord, we're grateful, as we've just sung, that death could not keep his prey, that Jesus rose the victor over that dark domain of death. And we have been taught by him that because he lives, we shall live also. And so we thank you for the blessed hope that we have in Jesus. And we ask that as we look at his uh, communication with these two disciples on that road to Emmaus this morning, that our hearts might begin to warm and even burn within us as they said that theirs did while he talked with them. So Lord, give us holy heartburn. Give us this burning heart. Let us join the club, if you will, of the burning hearts for the Lord Jesus. How we pray that you would just make these truths something that would uh, that would uh, grab and grip us and uh, that you would use your truth to sanctify and transform our lives. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I want to begin. What is... What is a burning heart? That's what they said in verse 32 of this 24th chapter of Luke. They said to one another after he vanished out of their sight, did not our heart burn within us? So what is a burning heart? Well, I think to define that, I have to begin by defining what the heart is. And I hope you, all of you guys, will follow with me and uh, will stay in tune. I believe that the human heart, as it's spoken of in the Bible, of course, isn't this organ that's beating in our, in our chest and pumping blood. I believe that the definition of the heart in the Bible is that it is the actual control center of the human personality. I think that without God's influence and impact upon our spiritual hearts, that uh, we are naturally deceitful people, that we are bent towards desperate wickedness. That's what Jeremiah says. 
And uh, in the uh, book of Mark and chapter 7 and verse 21, listen to what Jesus himself says about the natural condition of our spiritual heart. He says, for within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, and then he uses a big word, lasciviousness, which means just uh, unbridled lust, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things, Jesus says, comes from within man, from the natural human heart, and defiles him. So the heart, it's your inner person. Sometimes it's called in the Bible, your soul. I think that the heart and the soul are the same thing. And the soul of the person is the seat of our self-consciousness. Uh, our soul is how you and I relate to life on this earth. Our soul is the place where we can develop relationships with each other. That's our soul life. And there are three parts uh, to the human soul that I believe that the Holy Spirit of God is continually seeking to sanctify in the believer's life. I think that those three parts need to be sanctified because the human heart is like a garden full of weeds. And it constantly has to be weeded out. And so God, the Holy Spirit, is at work in the heart of believers constantly to pull the weeds up out of our heart that naturally grow there. The soul is made up, I said, of three parts. The first part is what the Bible sometimes calls the mind. And when the Bible talks about the mind, it's not talking about that organ in your head called the brain. The mind in the Bible is your inner man, where your thinking really resides. It's where your thoughts originate. And uh, the, the mind is that part that always needs a continual renewal. It needs to be renewed. And the way that the mind is renewed is by the Holy Spirit exposing our minds to the Word of God. And the result is our lives can be transformed. You know, Romans 12, 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Be completely changed from the inside out by the renewing of your mind. And so the Holy Spirit exposes our minds to his word to renew it because that's a need. We're told in Philippians 4, that we are to think on the right things, that our mind has to be focused on things that are right, things that are pure, things that are, are winsome, things that are praiseworthy, things that are just. We are to think on these things. We are also told in Colossians chapter 3 that we are to set our minds on things above, not on things of this earth. Too often, the whole bulk of our thinking is wrapped up in things on this earth, but we are to set our affection, literally our minds, on things above. And so the soul is made up of the mind, and the Holy Spirit is constantly seeking to sanctify our mind, our thinking. And then the soul also refers, or the heart, the soul, refers not only to the mind or our thinking, but to our affections. You say, well, what are our affections? Your affections encompasses everything that affects you. Your emotions are part of that, but your preferences, your desires, your aspirations, your purposes, your aim, your goal, all that pertains to that inner self life are your affections. 
And instead of seeking to please yourself, the Holy Spirit is seeking to uh, put within you to give you a desire to please God. Jesus says, but seek first, not your own things, but the things that pertain to the Lord, him, his kingdom. And Paul says, if you are saved, you're risen with Christ. And if you are risen with Christ, and he's talking a spiritual resurrection, you've been raised out of spiritual death. You are now spiritually alive. If you have been risen with Christ, he says, seek those things which are above. Seek those things which are above. He tells us that we are not to be covetous. We are not to be covetous, but we are to be content with such things that we have. And Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11 that we need to learn to be content. That contentment is something that the Spirit of God is constantly seeking to teach people. To be content with your current circumstances. To be content with whatever situation you're facing. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in our soul, in our heart, in that area called the affections. He's seeking to bring contentment there. And the third part of the heart or the soul is not just the mind, our thinking, not just our affections, but also our will. And your will, that part of the, of the heart, is the place where all your decisions and all your choices are made. And you've made a lot of them just in this past week. All of our choices and decisions are part of that heart called the will. And as God imagers, which we are created to be, we're God imagers, we possess the ability to make moral choices. We can choose right or we can choose wrong. And uh, the Holy Spirit is continually appealing to our human will. He's appealing to our will, and he is seeking to get us to choose to please God instead of pleasing ourselves. And really, that's the only choice. There's only two choices in life. Your will, your heart could either choose to please God or to please yourself. And so the Holy Spirit is at work. In fact, he tells us in, uh, Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 8, how futile it is to please ourselves. Uh, for he, he says in Mark 8, 35, whoever will try to spare himself will lose. But whoever does not seek to spare his life for the gospel's sake, for Jesus' sake, will actually save his life. And then he says this, for what shall it profit a person if they gain the whole world and lose their own soul? So in order to define for you and answer the question, what is a burning heart? These disciples said, didn't our heart burn within us? What is that? I've sought to define, first of all, what a heart is. It's that soul part of you. It's your, your mind and your affections and your will. And a burning heart is literally a heart that is set on fire, a heart that is lighted up, a heart that is warmed and lit up, that the Holy Spirit of God warms and lights your soul, the heart within you. It is a God-focused life. A burning heart is a desire to please God and not yourself. A burning heart is to be moved by God to do his will. And that is holy heartburn. And that's what I want for myself. And that's what I want for all of you as well. So that's what a burning heart is. So let me answer a second question this morning as we think about this. Why do you need a burning heart? If that's what it is. Okay, why do I need one? Well, I think it's pretty obvious uh, just to the definition of this. But you need one because without God stirring deep within you, 
your spiritual heart condition naturally is that our hearts are icy cold. Our hearts are lazy and lethargic toward God. There is no flame in the human heart without the Holy Spirit kindling it and stoking it. Without the Holy Spirit of God moving within you, convicting you, convincing you, speaking to you, directing you, making Jesus real and precious to you, your heart is naturally uninterested. And your response to God's work in you is very simple. You need to be cooperative. You need to cooperate with the work that he's doing. You need to cooperate and, and uh, respond to his voice within. You know, the Bible says that God speaks to us in a still small voice. Have you experienced that? Or you just know that this is God speaking to me. This is the spirit of God dealing with me. He speaks to us in a still small voice, and it's our responsibility to cooperate with him when we hear that. Which leads me to answer the final question I want to share with you from this text. And so go back to Luke 24 and the 32nd verse. Look at that verse again with me because Jesus had just uh, blessed and broke bread with them. And at that moment, as he distributed or gave that bread to them, it says that their eyes were open and he allowed them to recognize who he was. And at that very instant, he disappeared. He vanished. He wasn't at the table anymore. And their response is verse 32. They said to one another, did not our heart burn within us? While he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures, here is the answer to the question, how do you get a burning heart? If I, if I need it, if it's so necessary, well, how does that happen? You open your heart to Jesus, and he will feed the flame that the Holy Spirit kindles within you. It really requires that you determine that you're going to spend time with Jesus. You remember the story of Mary and her sister Martha? When Jesus stopped by their home there in the village of Bethany, and how that uh, Martha was busy preparing a meal for Jesus, but Mary took the time to set aside and sit, it says, at Jesus' feet and listen to him as he taught spiritual truth. You remember her sister Martha, who was so involved in preparing this delicious meal for Jesus. She had a, a good intention. She comes to Jesus and she complains and grumbles and murmurs against her sister and says, you know, you know, it's not fair that I'm doing all this work and here she is just sitting at your feet. Tell her to come help. You remember how Jesus gently rebuked Martha? He said, Martha, you're, you're, you're troubled about many things. But really, let me tell you, there's only one thing that really is necessary, and it's not a meal. There's only one thing that is needful, Jesus tells her. And that one needful thing Mary has chosen that, and that's the better part. That's the, that's the needful thing, and that's the best thing. And Mary has chosen the better part. Here she is sitting and listening to the spiritual truth that I'm seeking to communicate. You know, I'm convinced the most important ingredient in every Christian life is sitting at Jesus' feet in a spiritual sense. Spending time with Jesus, being with him in various ways, obviously time alone with him, but in other venues as well where Jesus really is present. And yet, sadly, I have to admit, I think that that one needful thing is the one missing thing in many Christian lives. Well, how do you get a burning heart? Look at verse 15 for a moment. 
you have two of Jesus's followers and they're walking home from Jerusalem to Emmaus, which was about a seven mile trip. And it says in verse 15, as these two followers of Jesus were talking together and uh, trying to piece together all that had happened over the last few days in Jerusalem, especially concerning Jesus. It says, verse 15, second part of it, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Jesus himself drew near and went with them. In verse 20, or 32, it says, he was with us by the way. One of the first important parts of getting a burning heart is really symbolized in this, and that is you have to walk with Jesus. He's got to walk with you. You must walk with Jesus. Jesus himself drew near. He went with them by the way. By the way. That is the the way that they were traveling. You know, your life is a journey. And it's going to end someday. You're going to come to the end of the journey someday. Make sure that on your life journey that you're traveling together with Jesus, that Jesus is walking with you, that you are walking with him on this journey of life. Now, I want you to note in verse 15 who it was that initiated this walk with Jesus. It wasn't them. It was him. I want you to understand that when it comes to who initiates walking with the Lord, it's Jesus that takes the first step to connect with these followers because he knows that they need him and he cares about them. Understand that there are times perhaps that you have not even realized that what is going on in your daily life is that Jesus is trying to connect with you. Oh, we are often in such a, a busy and, uh, and hurried life, such a rush, that we don't even understand that these circumstances, these events that are, are, have cropped up in our day that have perhaps interrupted our schedule or upset us, it's Jesus. He's trying to walk with you. He is trying to initiate a walk with you. He wants a relationship with you. He doesn't just want a relationship. He wants a close walk with you. He wants a close fellowship with you. Jesus, he initiates this. He wants to rescue you. You know, perhaps you've fallen into sin. He wants to rescue you from that sin that you have fallen into. He wants to pick you out of that pit of miry clay. If you've never been saved, Jesus wants to rescue you. He wants to pull you out of sin. He wants to forgive your sin. He wants to walk with you through the remainder of your life. If you're going through some trouble or difficulty or sorrow or grief, Jesus wants to walk with you. That's what all of this is about. You know, when things take place and things are, are perhaps are, are difficult or disagreeable or, or upsetting to us, perhaps we should understand this is Jesus trying to get us to walk with him. This is him initiating a walk with us. He wants that. He desires that. Jesus wants to travel with you. He wants to journey with you he, through your whole life. He wants to be with you, and, and uh, he wants you to be with him. So. He initiates it. But guess what? As often is the case, he initiates, but people don't always cooperate. And that's the other part of walking with him. Yes, Jesus initiates this walk, but you have to cooperate. It doesn't mean that because he initiates it, that there's nothing for you to do. 
that you take no initiative at all, not at all. Well, no, that's not what it means. You have to respond to his initiation by cooperating with Jesus, by welcoming him, welcoming him into your life for constant fellowship through each day. There should never be a day nor even a moment that you don't realize you need Jesus. You need to walk with him every moment of every day. There has to be that cooperation. Secondly, how can you get this burning heart? Walk with Jesus. But look at what else they say in verse 32. <clears throat> As uh, he disappeared, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us? How do you get a burning heart? You walk with Jesus, but also you talk with Jesus. They said he talked with us. He used his words to, to share his thoughts, his knowledge, his feelings with them. There has to be that talk with Jesus. Give him an opportunity to communicate. Jesus enters the followers' conversation there in that 15th verse and uh, the passage that, uh, that follows up, and he brings light to their ignorance. He brings knowledge and understanding to them, and, and by doing so, he gives them comfort. He gives them encouragement. He gives them hope. Did you know Jesus is always wanting to communicate with you. He's always wanting to communicate with you. He always wants to speak with you. And the best way that he does that is through the Bible. The best way that Jesus communicates with people is through this book that we call the Word of God, the Bible. So if you ignore the Bible, if you never read the Bible, if you... Don't open the Bible and look to hear the voice of Jesus communicating with you. He'll not talk to you. You won't hear from him, even though he wants to speak to you. He wants to be part of your communication as well. These guys, they were talking with one another. He, he kind of butted in, you might say, and he became part of the conversation. Did you know every conversation that you have, whether it be a verbal or virtual conversation, Jesus wants to be a part of that. And you have to remember that. You have to remember to include him in that. To talk with Jesus is the way in which you can have your heart burn within you. He tells us how to talk. He says, don't let any corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. And we hear it all the time. And sadly, sometimes it comes from us. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but instead the kind of talk that will build up your brothers and sisters, the kind of talk that will be a blessing to people that hear your words. And often pray, Lord, set a watch upon my mouth and keep the doors of my lips and as I start the day, oh, Lord, let my speech, my talk be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that I might know how I should answer every person that I come in contact with this day. You need God. You need to talk with Jesus. And you need to let him be a part of your talk as well. Whether it's a letter that you're writing, a note that you're sending off, an email, a text. I don't think they call them tweets anymore, but you know what I mean. All of that, Jesus wants, he wants to talk through your talk. He wants to be a part of what you communicate. That's what it means to talk with Jesus. He wants you to talk with him. <laughs> and he wants to talk through you. And so to talk with Jesus is to communicate, which is a two-way street, but also that requires that you participate. 
one of the best ways to participate in talking with Jesus is praying. And you have the wrong idea if you think that prayer is, you know, this, being on your knees and closing your eyes. I pray all the time when I'm behind the wheel and I don't close my eyes <laughs> for obvious reasons. But the fact of the matter is, folks, the Bible says that we are to pray without ceasing. And that terminology, without ceasing, is actually a, a phrase that refers to someone that has a hacking cough in which there's always that tickle in the back of your throat where you have that, that urge to cough. There's always that tendency uh, that remains. So prayer is something that is to be always recurring. You should never quit. It should be constant contact throughout the day, unbroken fellowship with the Lord, always in touch with him. That's what it means to pray, to participate, talk with Jesus. And there's a third and final thing I will uh, close with. <clears throat> you want a burning heart? I hope you do. You got to walk with Jesus. You got to talk with Jesus. And thirdly, notice what they said here. In verse 32, while he talked with us, by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures, you got to be taught by Jesus. Jesus wants to teach you. You got to be taught by him. He opened the scriptures to them, they said. And there's two parts to the meaning of that word opened. As I studied it out, it became very clear that first of all, the fact that he opened the scriptures to them means that he stimulated them. It was a stimulant. To, he opened their soul. He awakened the desire in their heart for spiritual biblical truth. You know, that's what the Holy Spirit of God does in us. He whets our appetite for the truth of God, maybe by a verse that we're memorizing maybe by a message that we hear or a song that is sung that is biblical or by a brother or sister that shares some scripture or some thought from scripture with us or some circumstance that arises. He stimulates. He opens our soul and awakens a desire for his truth. And here's what I think that you should do on a regular basis if you're a believer. Maybe you do this already. But I do this on a, on a daily basis. I ask God to give me a deeper spiritual hunger for him and for his word. Have you ever asked God to make you hungry for his word? To make you hungry for fellowship with him? You know, if you really mean that, guess what? He'll answer. He'll do it. And so ask him to stimulate Ask him to stir with you the deepest hunger that you could have, a craving for him and his word. But being taught by Jesus is not only to stimulate, but it also means to illuminate. He opened their minds. That is, he opened their mind by a clear explanation, bringing a, a thorough and a complete understanding to them. Reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, which is a wonderful insight into what we're saying, how the Holy Spirit of God turns the lights on in our mind, in our thinking. He says in uh, 1 Corinthians 2 in verse 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, revealed them. What's them? Spiritual truths. God reveals spiritual truths to his people by the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit of God searcheth all things, searches the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of the man save the spirit of man which is in him? That's what I was telling you a moment ago. When I talked about that part of, uh, of human beings, the soul, 
we can relate to one another out of our soul. And that's what he's saying in that 10th verse or, or 11th verse of 1 Corinthians 2. Because I'm a human being, I can relate to you as a human being. Because I'm a human being, I can understand you and your human needs. But then he says this, even so the things of God knows no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. You know, God wants to freely reveal things to you. He doesn't want to hold back truth from you. He wants to open the scriptures. He wants to open truth up to you. He wants to give you spiritual insight like you've never had before. You talk about expanding your mind. This is far beyond any, uh, any trip that people would take on drugs. He will expand your understanding if you let him. The Spirit of God lives in the believer and is able to expand our understanding. Look, if I had a, a book that was really important to me and I didn't understand a portion of that book, but I could track down the author or maybe I was a friend of the author and I could say, hey, you know, on page so-and-so on this line, what did you mean by that? Oh, oh, that's not how I took it. That's what you mean. All right. Well, did you know that you had the author of this book, the Spirit of God, in your human spirit? And when you get stuck, you need to ask him, Lord, what did you mean by that? And if you really are willing to be taught by him, he'll illuminate your mind. And, and, and he says, uh, things which we speak not in words or by man's wisdom, but which the Holy Spirit teaches the natural man can't understand this truth, but we can because we have the Spirit in us. This is holy heartburn here. This is why it's needed, and this is how you get it. By walking with Jesus, by talking with Jesus, and being taught by Jesus. I had a pretty lengthy conversation uh, this week with... Uh, my son that pastors in Maine, one of my boys pastors in Maine. And he was excited when he called me. He told me about a man that uh, he had been discipling recently. And he said uh, that um, his wife met this man's wife at one of the kids' ball games or something, and they struck up conversation, a little bit of a friendship. Uh, my son's wife invited her to church. She came a few times, and then a couple of times her husband came with her. Well, he was totally out of it. I mean, he didn't, uh, he didn't know if he even believed in God. In fact, uh, he believed more in aliens than anything else, which, by the way, is an increasing uh, philosophy uh, in modern life. But anyway, he said uh, this, this man would... Uh, came a couple of times and and finally my son said hey uh, Dan would you be willing in you know just uh, reading a portion of scripture with me once a week and maybe uh, we'll talk about it and uh, you know, he said well I'm not, not really interested but eh, give it a try so uh, my son was led to a little uh, eight lesson study in I think it was the gospel of Mark and just eight lessons, and then just four questions after each lesson. And what they would do, he'd come, and he they would just, uh, my son would read half of the passage, and then this other man, he, he would read the second half of the passage, and then they'd just discuss the question. He said, you know, he said, the first half of the whole time, he was just venting on me. Uh, oh, how horrible his life is, you know, and I just let him vent. And then we just did our reading and discussed the questions. And he said, uh, you know, after a while, uh, things started to change. He started to have his mind opened and he started to think, well, you know, maybe there is something to this. And he would send my son texts. And eventually he said, 
I really think the guy saved. He didn't say the sinner's prayer, but this whole his whole mind has changed. His whole life has changed. He still has some of the old language there, but you know that'll go eventually. He said, "I'm not ready to let him come up before the church and give a testimony because he's got to clean up his his uh, verbiage a little bit." But he said, "This guy, he went from being a you know an atheist or at least an agnostic." And now this guy is on fire. He said uh, he went to an AA meeting and, and he stood up and gave his testimony of how he found his higher power uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, and he picked up one of the guys and brought him home uh, to uh, where he was staying and uh, witnessed to him the whole car ride home. And he said, Pastor Jamie, if I can... I'm going to fill this church with people like that. And so it's just really neat to see. Now, Dan is walking with Jesus. He's talking with Jesus in a baby way, the way he knows. And he's being taught by Jesus. And his life has changed. The guy's being transformed. And it's just, this is what it means to have a burning heart. And this is what you need. And this is what I need. And this is what this world needs. They need a burning heart. They need to have a face-to-face, -face, so to speak, confrontation and encounter with the living, risen Christ.